So welcome, my friends, <laughs> to the Jumpstart Your Journey to Cloud Native session with SUSE Manager. And I am Stacy Miller. I'm based in the US out of Austin, Texas. And with me is Miguel Perez. Say your Col Col Colino. Who is the director of SUSE Manager out of Madrid? So we're going to cover today, real briefly, I'm going to tell you what SUSE Manager is um, and why you should be using it, how you can containerize your apps, and then we're going to take you on, Miguel will take you on SUMA's own journey to containerization, starting with the proxy and ending with the server. So what is SUSE Manager and why should you care? It's a question I get asked often as the product marketing manager. <laughs> so SUSE Manager is really true open source infrastructure management. And it's, it's a solution that manages not just SUSE's own SLUS, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, but it also manages more than 16 Linux distributions, all from a single console. And it doesn't matter where those distributions are. Those distributions can be in the cloud, they can be on premises, they can be in multi-clouds, they can be a combination. You can see it. You can see your entire environment from a single console with SUSE Manager. And we kind of bucket the reasons why you need SUSE Manager into three different buckets. The first one being security, which we know is really a big, um, it's a big pain point for many companies. The cost of security is enormous and 60% of cyber attacks occur because a system is unpatched. So SUSE Manager handles security by providing CVE patches for all those distributions and allowing you to schedule those CVE patches through the internal cal calendaring tool. You can set up SCAP profiles for your different systems and then you can monitor those systems using OpenSCAP to make sure that your systems are the same configuration as you want them to be. We also um, integrate really well with Prometheus and Grafana for real-time monitoring and dashboarding. And then if you're in a situation where you really cannot afford downtime due to servers being down, we integrate with live patching, which can give you, give you really up to a year of patching without taking down your servers. The next reason is really simplicity. We know that patching is really the bane of every administrator's existence. They don't like to patch. Manual patching is dangerous. It can cause human error. So we use automation with SALT and we also allow you to import your Ansible playbooks into SUSE Manager. Um, you can schedule those patches out using internal scheduling. And then um, we have something within SUSE Manager called Content Lifecycle Management, which means that you don't ever have to put a patch into production without testing it first. And then finally, we talk about scalability. People are scaling, you know, you guys are scaling your systems up, you're scaling them out. SUSE Manager works with all of the SLUS variations from Slay Micro to IBM Z systems. And with the hub architecture, SUSE Manager allows you to manage, what we say in marketing, more than a million, up to a million instances, but we do have a customer who's managing 90,000 endpoints in production today. So really the scalability problem is solved with SUSE Manager. And then I talked a little bit about content staging, but content staging is really important because you don't want to grab a patch and put it directly into production. So SUSE Manager allows you to take that patch, put it into your dev environment. You can do some testing on it. You can take it through QA, make sure your applications work, your workloads are working, and then move it into production. It's a very easy way, a very nice way of making sure that the patches that you're applying to your systems 
will not inadvertently bring down your systems for some inexplicable reason. And we talked about managing anything, anywhere with SUSE Manager. In fact, we like to say so SUSE Manager manages any Linux, anywhere, at any scale. That means if you have workloads on-premises, in the cloud, if you have hybrid clouds, multi-clouds, private clouds, SUSE Manager works the same way everywhere. If SUSE Manager can see the workload, SUSE Manager can manage the workload. And finally, again, I want to say that SUSE Manager does not just manage slots. It manages Sling Micro, it manages all the RHEL variations from 7 to 9, and all the variations of RHEL, so Oracle Linux, CentOS, Liberty, Alma Linux, Rocky Linux. If you're using, if you're a Red Hat shop, and you know that your, your developers are using Debian, you can manage the Debian servers and the RHEL servers with SUSE Manager. You don't even need to have slots. So that, I think, brings me to the end of the marketing section. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Miguel now. Miguel's going to talk about how you can containerize your apps and what we're doing within the SUSE Manager team on our journey to containerization. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, so you may be wondering, what does this have to do with Cloud Native? Okay, and it has to do a lot with Cloud Native, but first we have to put it in context, okay? We talked about SUSE Manager. All right, let me introduce you to Uyuni. Okay, Uyuni is a project, you know, in truly open source fashion. We have an open source project with this open source governance that is open to contributions, it's open to external uh, inputs, patches, fixes, uh, etc. L let me, you see Astra Linux? This was one, uh, not even a customer, it was someone who was using Astra Linux and they needed someone to, to manage it. This was an open source contribution to the product, it went, I mean, to the project and then from the project went into the product. So we're really open to contributions. That's one of the reasons we are managing so many distributions, okay? Let me remind you of this sentence by Linus Tobos, the Linux philosophy is laugh in the face of danger. <laughs> Oops, wrong one. Do it yourself, okay? So in this case, it's do it yourself. How do we modernize this project to Uni? How do we modernize SUSE Manager? So we're, we're doing it ourselves, and we went inside of our own company, or SUSE, and it's like, what do we have to modernize? And then we realized we have plenty of tools to modernize, okay? From the Slim Micro operating system with Podman to run containers to K3S to run uh, small Kubernetes clusters, very lightweight, to RKE2 that runs uh, large Kubernetes clusters, to Rancher to manage all these clusters, to all of that. So it's like, okay, let's do it ourselves. Normally you say, you eat your own dog food, we rather think that we are drinking our own champagne. So what is, what is the strategy here? So the strategy here is like, first, you're running applications on a Linux host, traditional Linux host, let's say this is, for example, Debian 11, okay? Let's say this is SUSE Linux Enterprise 12 or 15. And you have this SUMA agent that keeps the system up to date, that updates the configuration, keeps it where you want, and you're running the application on top of that. What would, if, uh, would be the first step, okay? And that is something that many people think, what do I do now with this application, okay? So our suggestion is first, put the application in a container, a big, chunky container. Okay, running on your traditional operating system, you can still SSH into the operating system, see the container, you can still use system need to start the container, stop the container, you can connect all the folders to the, to the, the container running inside the operating system, and you can connect the ports that need to go into it. So you're using it in a mixed way. It's not completely containerized, but it's not, of course, cloud native, but it's almost there. You start learning how to build your container images, you start learning about Podman, you start learning about all the basics that you're going to need to be completely cloud native. Second stage, uh, of course, you can have your system manager agent to keep the system up to date and to update whatever is in there. Next stage, let's change the operating system, which is a huge overhead, to reduce that overhead to the minimum. Think about reducing three 10% overhead in every workload that you have on cloud. 
that is a lot of money in savings. So right now we have a micro OS in SUSE called SLE Micro. You have the OpenSUSE Micro, of course, version of it, if you want to go to the project. So both of them are completely compatible. You can go with one or the other, you're good with it. So you find this micro OS that is completely thought to run containers. And then you start putting the containers there. You reduce the footprint, you reduce the, the addressable, the, the, the attack surface, and you make it a lot easier to update. Of course, you can keep using SUSE Manager there. Then you add Kubernetes. How do you add Kubernetes? K3S is the best way to start with it. So you can deploy K3S from SUSE Manager, maintain K3S from SUSE Manager, maintain the operating system from SUSE Manager, and start moving those containers into cloud-native containers. This is the end container. Okay, so I'm, I'm dividing the application into chunks, and those chunks can run nicely on Kubernetes. So I'm starting to move those containers. And then you go all in with Cloud Native, with Kubernetes on top of, of a micro OS, with all the Cloud Native containers running on top of Kubernetes. This is the path that we are following, and we are more or less here. <laughs> okay, so. What was your journey? Our journey, um, we're sharing it with you so you can say, okay, let's follow it. Let's, let's go ahead with you. Let's engage on, on, on the upstream community with Uduni and let's, let's follow it. So first, where do we come from? Does this apply to me? You know, many customers are going to think, many people are going to think, does this apply to me? Maybe your application was so ready to be cloud native. Let me tell you, this application started in 2008, okay? This was the upstream for Satellite 5 and for SUSE Manager before 3.2. Okay, and the project shut down already in 2020. This is, and this code from it, still there. Okay, so it's not a new application. This is brownfield uh, um, transformation. Okay, so what is the difference between a junior and a spacewalk? At some point in time, SUSE wanted to put uh, SALT, which is an automation uh, mechanism or automation tool, together with the patching tool. And this is where Ujuni appeared, okay? We added SALT to Spacewalk, we put it together, we merged them very nicely, and this is what Ujuni is, okay? What is SALT? SALT is an automation uh, tool that is assisted to use as Ansible, if I may, but it has many of the good features of Puppet, like for example, an agent, certificates to, to understand the scalability due to having an agent, you know? Some people think, oh, I don't want to have agents, but then when you want to scale, is more difficult. Some other people want to say, no, I have an agent, I have my inventory completely up to date every single day. And then of course, if I need to run something, everything can run in a more a scalable way, okay? So SALT is built with um, React. It has a way of where I've written React and Python 3. Very common, okay? So again, why does it matter? This is the typical implication. Java, Tomcat, PostgreSQL database, Python, JavaScript, okay? So this is a typical application you can find. I mean, even I, I've been working with finance a lot in banks. And the applications, of course, are, are a lot larger than this one. But the, the, if you go X-ray with it, these are the components in there. So we are doing something that you can do on your own with these same tools, okay? So the challenge. First, what are our goals? Our goal, of course, is to put this tool into containers and then to make it into components as it makes sense. What is underneath the covers in Ujuni and SUSE Manager? We have these components. You see Apache, Cobbler, Saltmaster, Scripts, Tomcat, Taskomatic, PostgreSQL. So Apache, right now, we still need it, okay? But if we think about a Kubernetes environment, we will not need Apache because it's just to redirect connections to Tomcat and to manage the certificates. Kubernetes can do that. So at some point in time, we may get rid of Apache whenever we go Kubernetes, but meanwhile, we can keep it for the environments that do not have Kubernetes. We have Cobbler, which is written in Python that manages as operating system images and pixie booting, okay? We have the Salt Master, which is the, the component that, uh, that all the systems are going to connect to, okay? And it's written in Python. Then Tomcat with the Java application, Taskomatic is a kind of cron written in Java that has an API that you can inject uh, tasks and then it will run it and schedule them. And of course, PostgreSQL. So at some point in time, several of these components, okay, are going to be its own container. But the starting point is putting everything into one large big container that Kubernetes 
normally complains about. So we're going to run that container directly on the operating system, okay? So our goals, make it easy for users that are not used to containers. Most of our customers, most of our users, let's just search into the system and start doing things. So we have to make it easy for them, okay? We have to be independent from the host operating system. Right now, uh, Ujuni only runs on OpenSUSE, or as less, of course, you know? But we want customers who are running Debian, I mean, if you're running Debian on your laptop, we want you to be able to run this, okay? If you're running, I don't know, Rocky Linux, we want you to be able to run this. We want to make it more modular. This is like phase two, and we want easier dependency management. Of course, um, when you have containers, all the dependencies are in the container, so you can manage the, 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 the dependencies independently of the uh, operating system. We want to make it easier to maintain. You download a new image, you stop the previous image, start the next image, and then it starts, you're good to go, roll back to it the other way around, unless you have made changes to the database in which you have to take it into account and have some script to take care of that. We want to do faster innovation, modernize everything in the applications and align with DevOps strategies that we have in, in the company, okay? So know your weaknesses. First, what is unfriendly to containers? I mean, there's this project that is open source that I know quite a lot, which is called MindUp. And uh, this is a tool that you can scan Java code and it will find some things that are not container friendly. Like for example, if you are using, uh, to store the session of a user, you're putting it in a file on the operating system. That is not container friendly. If you have uh, fixed IPs or, or fixed URLs put in your code, it will detect them, it will raise things. So some of our pain points, file shared by components, call to external tools not done properly, like going to a file, you know. Um, we need to have a full qualified name for the, uh, for the tool to run correctly, and we need to have a specific time zone for the tool to run correctly. So we are fixing these ones, and we are starting the journey with this. So first step, as I said, create a single container. We are there. In SUSE, we have the SLES operating system, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, and the OpenSUSE LEAP operating system. And both of them, you can get the, what we call the base container image. Base container image is a container image that you can use to create your own Docker profiles. There's one base container image that comes with systemd inside of the container image. This is perfect for this case, okay? You put everything in there, systemd starts all the services within the container, okay? So you don't have to change things. So whenever you have components that you can get outside of it, you have another container image, which is a minimal container image that you can put it, this component outside and then start connecting to it. So we have all the tools, as you see, operating system-wise, uh, Kubernetes-wise, to be able to do this. So next step, components to extract. So probably it's very likely that our first component to extract will be the database, PostgreSQL. Why? Because there are already a lot of images with PostgreSQL that we can consume and we do not have to maintain. We just consume them, we put the data in them, we check for them, we check for the, of course, we have to do our duties to check that everything is okay with that image, that we know the sources and so on, but we will not have to maintain it. So that's something we want to add. And then we keep containerizing things. Of course, we need to know when to stop, okay? If you put everything into too many small pieces, then you start losing all the benefits of putting things into container. So you have to be very careful and check, does this make sense before there? So we started with a small project and we did it with, um, with the proxy. The proxy for Ujuni and SUSE Manager is a squid proxy with some add-ons to manage the squid proxy remotely. And it's done with, um, I mean, and it can connect to, to SUSE Manager to be managed, okay? So this was a small, very tiny. So we put it in container, now you have the proxy completely supported in container form to be able to be used by you. So we started first with a small project to learn the basics, and then we moved to larger projects. Again, SUSE Manager proxy can be used in containers, okay? So as I said, when you cut in the pieces, first find a DC one, then are you already container, uh, is the piece already container ready? This was not, we have to adapt it. Are you going to uh, use only configuration? Are you going to add other things to it? Because I mean, if you need to inject some files into it, it's going to be more difficult. How many changes does it require? What value does it bring, okay? Can I scale with this? I mean, in this container image, 
is uh, we are taking the steps to be able to scale it out with Kubernetes. Okay, we're not there yet, but we're doing that. One of the beauties of Kubernetes is that if you have a container image that can do something, you can create new instances with the workload. Okay, so can we do better modularization? Okay, can we make the modules in a better way? And will it be easier to maintain this way? I mean, if the answer to that one is no, it's like, stop. <laughs> okay, we don't want to add this. What are we using? Initial tool, we're using Podman, of course. Podman comes with uh, OpenSUSE Linux uh, uh, Leap, comes with OpenSUSE Linux Tumbleweed, comes with SUSE Linux Enterprise, and comes with almost any distribution nowadays. So Podman is very, is pervasive, you know, it's everywhere. So you can use it very easily. Then, of course, we are trying to use uh, RKE2, we, we did it, we did a prototype, we have to use Nginx Ingress Controller instead of Apache, we realized it was a lot easier to use in RKE2 to manage all the certificates than what we're doing right now with Apache, okay? And then we tried the lighter version with K3S, and uh, we use traffic to redirect the, the, the traffic, oh, traffic to redirect the, tra the network traffic uh, to the container, and it worked really well. It was very lightweight, it added very little uh, overhead, and it made the application run very nice. So right now we have a very large container that even it is supposed to not be handled nicely by Kubernetes, when we run it with RKE2 and K3S, it runs, and it runs quite well, okay? However, it cannot scale out, okay? That's uh, the drawback. We still need to improve that container to make it uh, horizontally scalable, okay? So again, one step at a time, base container image with systemd, you have it right there, please, if you want to try it, take a picture of it. Mount volumes, of course, where am I storing data to mount the volumes correctly? Uh, tune the setup, start trying things. Uh, SSL, if you're going to, to, if you can let others do it, it's a lot better, especially in Kubernetes, that part is super well implemented and uh, you can do the termination at the ingress level, which means the ingress component of Kubernetes can take care of the certificates and then have an encrypted traffic in between the, the ingress layer and the container. And we are working on the initial Helm chart, still not available. The image is still not available. So stay tuned, go to Uni project from time to time and check because we're going to, whenever we have a, a, the public image and it's going to take weeks, uh, it's going to be there for you to try it and test, 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 and then test, okay? So we also thought, what about the people who are already using Ujuni or Suse Manager? Do we do the migration in place? How do we do it? So the idea is that no, we don't, we're not going to do in-place migration. We're going to have a new machine and we're going to provide the tools to go Ujuni ADM migrate. It will get the information from the first machine, it will inject it into the new machine, you power down the first one, you change the DNS, and then all the systems will start connecting there. Something went wrong, you power down this VM, you power up the previous VM, all good, okay? So we are going to include that. How are we doing it? We learned from Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a wonderful tool. So you have the kubectl to connect to Kubernetes and do things with containers, and the kubeadm to deploy it. We have created Ujuni ADM to deploy and manage and migrate and whatever, and upgrade the the Ujuni and, and Source Manager, and we created Ujuni CTL. This is completely in early stages, so if you want to hack it, it's a very good moment now, okay? To connect to the API, get information, to be able to uh, get yourself into the container and be able to run scripts there, okay? So these are the utility tools, and of course, documentation that we need to update. This is it. Questions, come on. Go, shoot. What did you do with Postgres? So the question is, what did you do with Postgres? Right now, Postgres is part of the big, large container. I know it sounds like, oh my God, really? Yes, really, okay? It's like taking no risks, putting everything into one container, so people understand this is exactly the same as I had before in a container, and then we will start splitting it out. We already started the initial test to do that, but first we want to polish, we want to finish well phase one, which is having one large container that world runs nicely and uh, when put in production, and then we'll go to phase two. Thanks for the question, by the way. More questions? If you don't ask questions, I'll do a demo. I'm warning you. <laughs> I have a question. Go. Okay, so 
The question is, what do we say to a user that doesn't want to use Kubernetes? Use Kubernetes. No, no, I mean, you have to be ready to use Kubernetes, okay? It's like boxing. You have to be ready to get in the ring. You have to train first, and then you get in the ring. If not, you can end up uh, injured very badly, okay? So you have to train to get in the ring first. And uh, for users who don't want to run Kubernetes, we still can manage containers, okay? You can run a container in the operating system. And for that, we have two things. One, right now, today, SLE Micro, SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro, that you can run containers on top of it. With systemd, you start the container, you manage it as it is, you need to patch it, you create a new image, you change the image. Pretty straightforward. In the future, we're going with ALP, the adaptable Linux platform. This is going to go even deeper with the containerization of the operating system. So we will try to make it, I mean, we have uh, the, the product manager here, but so if I say anything wrong, please correct me. Uh, so. Uh, we will try to make it as containerized as possible so you can handle the whole software lifecycle with containers, okay? So that will be the, the first deliverables of ALP. So you can run operating system containers in a way that will be container native, not cloud native, without Kubernetes and very lightweight. So for people who are just getting adopted or they want something very, very extremely lightweight for very heavy uh, containers, that could be the option, okay? so. Of course, we want you to be cloud native and make the, uh, make the most of being able to scale out and being able to standardize everything with Kubernetes. I mean, the interfaces of Kubernetes are super good, are very standard, they help you use it anywhere almost the same way. So this is really a, a good benefit, but we understand that some people or some workloads are not ready for that. So we offer this uh, stage in which you can run containers on top of the operating system and you go with it, okay? However, the plan is please become cloud native. It has so many benefits that it's very interesting. If you're moving into the Kubernetes direction, that also means that you're moving to Rancher? Well, I mean, you can go Rancher or you can use any other tool. Of course, if you ask me, I will tell you, try Rancher. I'm not telling you, I'm telling you, try it. Okay. There's an overlap. Is there an overlap between what I've been talking about and Rancher? I mean, Rancher is a Kubernetes cluster manager, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, if you're going to put a workload on top of a Kubernetes, I suggest you to use Rancher. Okay. Underneath, I mean, you can use K3S, you can use RKE2 that we provide, but you can use any other Kubernetes provider, like, for example, AKS from Azure. Azure Kubernetes servers, or the Elastic Kubernetes server from AWS, or the Google Kubernetes server from Google, and then connect with Rancher and be able to go multi-cloud very easily. So, but that's your choice. I mean, at SUSE, we want you to have choice. We want you to be able to choose what you want to use to run your workloads, and we try to offer the best ones. Did I reply to your question? Okay, so that's a yes. More questions? I'm, I'm warning, I will do a demo if you don't ask questions, yes. Okay, so the question is why not going the VM way instead of going the before, one bit? Uh, before the containers way, going the VM way? Uh, I mean, that is a tricky question, okay? It's a difficult one. So uh, many customers that are on-prem are already using VMs, okay? Many customers that are on, all the customers, well, not all, because there are also bare metal instances, but many customers that are on cloud are using VMs already. Okay, so I think we are already there in the virtualization part. If you have a component that is not, and let me go back to this slide. If you have a component that is not easy to containerize, of course you can put it in a VM. You have Kubert that can run VMs on top of Kubernetes and use all the Kubernetes native. So using a VM could be used, okay? But the thing is that this is keeping you back in your way to containers. So if you put everything in VMs, of course, you will have some benefits, 
but then you are not starting to use container images, you're not starting to, to build the images and create your pipelines in, for example, your Jenkins or whatever you're using to build those pipelines, those images in pipelines, you're not starting to automate all of that, and then you're getting stuck in the, in the previous paradigm. You're not moving. So you're telling me if, it's a, if it is a way to instruct customers to go uh, yeah, the, the you can start with one and then Well, um, I think customers normally instruct us. <laughs> so in some way, I think customers will get here on their own. I don't think we have to instruct them. They are, they are all every day working with it. And that provides you a, a point of view that is very valuable. And, uh, and therefore, we listen to customers. And we arrived to this point because of listening to customers saying, hey, if you go into a VM, this is going to take even longer to get it outside of there. So going the one big container way could uh, really unlock your situation. More questions? Okay, let me give you, uh, I, I, was, I, was, um, I was saying it, so let me show you this okay so this is my laptop of course OpenSUSE leap 15.5 um, i'm ssh in another vm you know you know this vm manager this is so cool you know you can create vms you don't have to install anything weird on your laptop it comes with the operating system so nice so clean okay so we have this this machine okay you see here we have uduni adm uduni ctl this comes from a repository that is uduni tools Oh my God. We do need tools. Okay. Okay, this is a pull request. This is Uduni tools. Okay. So you download this and it has a, a bash.sh. You run it. You need to have Podman there and it will compile everything for you and it will create the Uduni ADM, Uduni CTL binaries. It's very, very easy, very straightforward. Let me show you. You need tools. So I have the code here. It will download the image, it will just compile it, it will create the binaries in the bind folder, bin folder. Okay, maybe I'm asking for too much for the laptop. Okay, ls bin. So you see, right created right now, fresh, out of the oven, okay? So you copy these two to the, your operating system here. I have it here, I copy it to user bin to make it easier to use. So now, if you run this command line, okay, on any system that has Podman, but we recommend OpenSUSE 15.5 leap version, it will install, configure all the ports and configure all the, the mount points for your container, okay? And it will create the system, the, the system, the init, image, and so on. What is inside this Uduni ADM YAML? It's a very long YAML file, okay? So I created this, um, this file you add your password for the database, you add your password for the certificate that is going to be created and the image. I mean, you can take a picture of this. This URL is, is valid, you can use it, okay? So if you want to give Uduni a go, the latest version, I mean, it's not completely published, but it's available, so go and try it, okay? So running this will take me to this situation in which I can go system CTL as any admin, status, Uduni, server, service. And it will say, oh, everything is running, you know? have this container running. If I run Podman PS, it will show me the container image that is running, and of course, all the posts that have been redirected. Take into account that we're doing TFTP for pixie booting, take into account that we need to have ports 4505 and 4506 for, for SALT, uh, 443 and 80, and 8080 for, for proxying and so on. So if I go here, this is what I get, okay? first. The first time you log in, it will go, please create an organization and give me your user and password, okay? But then you will get it here, it will be immediate, and then you can go admin, and my, the password I provided, and here you are. This is Ujuni running on a container 
on top of OpenSUSE Leap 15.5. Okay, I really encourage you to go to the Uni project, try it, contribute to it, and if you want to manage uh, tens of thousands of systems that are Linux, I really recommend you to check uh, on SUSE Manager. And uh, I think that's it for me. Oh, one more point, about one million clients, we tried with fake clients, hammering one hammering servers, and we managed to get one million without breaking it. So that's the theoretical limit that we have tested. But with real production servers, we have managed to, having more than one server, more than one uh, proxy, we have managed to run, we are managing to run, as of today, 90,000 devices in, in production. So one last question, going once, going twice, gone. Thank you very much for coming, a pleasure being here.